Too, if you if you want to reach us for any reason. So this story started quite literally in our backyard, quite close to home. Uh, we live in Seattle. This is a house that we got, and I, for all of my life, have always wanted a garden. And you can see here that there is one, one big blank slate here. And in Seattle, everything is green, and we might think, wow, that looks great, all that greenery, especially if you're living in a place that's burning up or really hot. The problem is, long ago the old growth forests were cleared out of Seattle, and all we had was old growth lawn. So this is, <laughs> this is mostly dandelions, not even the edible kind. Stickery, kind of nasty. Uh, but for a gardener, it was sort of like a palette, something I could start creating things on. And that's what I began to do. I began to scheme and to dream about a garden. What plants where, what would it look like through the seasons, all of this stuff. This took a little while, all this dreaming and scheming, but eventually we got going. And when you look at this dirt, this is not my dream. This is my dream going down the tubes. And this is dead dirt. And it's a little embarrassing that a biologist, that's my background, uh, and a geologist did not dig soil pits in their own lawn to take a look at the soil. So here we were, it was also a bad time of year, it was mid-August, we had plants waiting to get in the ground, we had this dead dirt, and so I went into panic mode, frankly. And it's what I call my organic matter chronicles. This is where I had done enough gardening to know organic matter. Let's just start there. Let's start with getting some organic matter into the soil because that is the only thing that's going to keep these plants alive and going. See what happens. And I started to search around and lay my hands on every kind of type of organic matter, free or cheap, that I could find. And many of these things are familiar to people in this room. Maybe one thing that isn't is pile C here, which is zoodoo. In Seattle, our zoo uh, composts the manure of herbivores, elephants and wildebeest and those kinds of things. And then gardeners storm the gates to get that stuff. They release it about two times a year. Uh, another another uh, kind of organic matter that I really love was composted coffee grounds here. It's just got a really nice... Uh, particulate kind of a texture it breaks down quickly and you can mix it with bigger things and I in my mulch mixes wood chips were sort of always a base for things and I would mix other things into the wood chips and that just gives you a, a, a sense of the kind of things that I was you know constantly scrambling to uh, find and bring into the yard and stockpile and so I mentioned mulch mixes, and this is what I really love to do, is I love to collect my organic matter, and I have it stashed away in piles, 
and then I mix various things together. And compost is both sort of part, part art and part science. And so there's something called the greens and the browns. And the important thing to remember, brown is carbon sources, greens are your nitrogen sources, and you always want um, a lot more carbon than you do nitrogen. The ratio is roughly 10 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So this is one of my mulch mixes, my, one of my crazy mulch mixes. I call this the beautiful goods. Um, what we have in there are hinoki clippings. Uh, hinoki is a kind of evergreen tree. We've got three of them uh, in the garden. From time to time I prune them and I just strip the needles off and they become uh, part of mulch mix. The neighbor gave me a lovely hydrangea bouquet and I enjoyed that for about three days and then I put it into the mulch mix. It's nice. Those petals are going to break down you know, really, really quickly. And then in the summertime, I'm constantly sort of snipping and pruning at things. And the nice thing about especially spring or summer growth of leaves is it's really soft and it breaks down really quickly. So I like, I like fresh leaves a lot. They, they're pretty. Um, they add, uh, you can see various you know, greens and there's some yellows and things in there. And then always my you know, decaying wood chips. So this is sort of the basics of mulch mixing and or mulch, mulch recipes and then mixing. I think, I think you can really do a lot with organic matter that's just, um, that's just laying around. Uh, in Seattle we have uh, yard, it's called yard waste service and I really want to get, I want to brand that with another name, that's another project to do. I want to call it microbial food or food for the soil because I, I, like I don't like the waste part of that. Anyway, another, another, another project. Um, also, I use the living goods. So this is compost tea. And I started a worm bin, and vermicompost or, or worm, worm castings, I think, are some of the finest composts um, that you can get. It's, it's, it's incredibly um, rich in carbon and in all kinds of different nutrients. So. The way my worm composter or my worm uh, worm tea brewer works is there's a little bag here you can't quite see it it's sitting down there in the bucket it's filled with worm compost this is my aerator I put a nutrient solution in there and I just let that brew and bubble away for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours and then I spray it out on plants I use the um, compost tea a lot when we were first getting the garden going because. Plants are small. I mean, they're, you know, you put a new plant in the ground, it's a bit like a child. It needs some help, it needs some watching, it needs some caretaking. And so the compost tea uh, certainly helped that along. It's a nutrient source. And I, I also have some plants that are a little bit susceptible to some molds and mildews. And I spritz them with the, with the compost tea. Done. That mold and mildew goes away. So this is another, uh, an, another thing to think about when you're gardening. And lo and behold, that dead dirt that I showed you, I needed to tell you know, part of the problem in Seattle is that we have a glacial history. And so long, long, long ago, there was a mile of ice, and that compacted everything. And it's actually a geologic deposit called glacial till. It's like concrete, literally. So this is, this is part of the problem. What you can see happening here, this is the underlying glacial till right here. And this is soil that's been infused with organic matter. All of those mulch mixes that I just showed you are gradually breaking down. I just layer them on the top. There's no need to be digging anything into the soil. There is a lot of biology, a lot of life in the soil, and these creatures are tiny. And you just, you just don't want to needless, you don't, you don't want to over disturb the soil because every time you're doing that, you're killing part of your soil life. And as I'll go into, there's a lot of reasons that you want to keep your soil life around. So this was done, this, this sort of restored soil picture here, this took about five years. And that is really pretty remarkable. There's not a lot of things that, that turn around in nature in that short a time. And that's why I think soil has so much potential for so many things from uh, returning, using soil to store carbon, using soil to get more nutrients into our food, their water retention, all those types of things. So all that was going on below ground, this is what was going on above the ground. I don't know if anyone noticed 
in that shot of dead dirt, but this is that same garage. It's the same view back. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is what a farmer or a gardener can reap when you start feeding the soil. Flowers, of course, that's part of why we garden. Flowers for people, flowers for pollinators. So this is all um, all what a living soil can do for you. I love this. Got dirt? Get soil. This is what we did. When we first started, uh, soil carbon was right around 1%. Right now, today, we just did, this is actually probably two, as of two years ago, um, we tested soil, and in, we've got ornamental beds. We have a, a, this eco lawn. It's a mix of yarrow and clover and some other things. And soil carbon in those two locations is up to now about 7% or so. And in the veg beds, you sort of have a garden within a garden. I'll get to those slides in a minute. Uh, of course, I'm adding a lot of organic matter into the veg beds, especially worm compost and so on. And so we've got carbon now up to 12% in the veg beds. And most native soils are, depending on where you are, um, 1 2 3%. Someone who, a farmer who's been constantly re, uh, returning organic matter to the soil, maybe they're getting upwards of maybe 5 6 7% even. So 12%. Um, it's pretty amazing, and here's, here's uh, sort of the whole take home on this. It takes nature 500 years to make an inch of fertile soil. And what if, I showed you that picture, what if we were turning our dead dirt into fertile soil in a matter of about five years? Think what could happen on every farm and garden in this country. It, it's really, I think, quite extraordinary, and I think it's a hugely, um, huge untapped potential. So I want to talk a little bit about the veg beds. Um, we, we are fortunate in Seattle that we have some fantastic farmer's markets. I think if we didn't have that, I would probably turn a lot more of our lot into a food growing area. Um, but this is sort of the primary um, veg bed that we have, and I like to, um, usually late winter, early spring, is when I, I start to add things to the veg bed. So I just want to run you through some of the things that I do. Uh, biochar, this is you know pure carbon into the soil, and what I've got going here, this is worm compost in the bottom of the wheelbarrow. This is biochar here, and I'm mixing that together because I want to get the biochar, which has no life in it at all. It's, it's inert. It's, it's just um, pyrolyzed wood. I want to get the microbes on that right away because the carbon stays um, pretty inert and pretty static in the soil, so it's sort of like a permanent residence, if you will, for microbial life. And this is my little uh, uh, sea char, which is a local group in Seattle, was giving away prototype biochar stoves, and so I, I got some and was able to actually make a little bit of my own biochar, and I didn't burn the house down or anything, so that was that was really good. Uh, and then I just mix that up, and I layer that on top of the veg bed. Again, I'm not mixing this this deep in. I, I although I might use something as nutritive as worm compost and the biochar. I'm not like digging a soil in or, or a shovel in and turning the whole thing over. If I'm doing any any mixing at all, it's it's with a little bit of a, like a hand trowel or with my hand, doing it pretty lightly. I had mixed this biochar with my worm compost. Yeah, so de definitely, yeah, because it's, otherwise there's no real life in there. And I mean, things, there's life in the soil, and so it'll crawl onto the biochar, but you always want to quicken things up in a veg, veg garden. A quick, yeah. I'm unclear on biochar. Is oh, I'm sorry. more than charcoal? Uh, no, it is really nothing more than charcoal, uh, but, Biochar that's made sort of at an industrial level, it's done through a process called pyrolysis because what you don't want to do is be burning wood and all of these, all of this smoke and particulates going up in the atmosphere. You don't want to do that. So pyrolysis is a very low oxygen burning environment. That's the difference between charcoal you pick up out of a fire pit and biochar. All right, so I just layer it on, mix it in a little, a, a little bit, but try to minimize that. And then, 
Of course, I always have pieces of a, you know, various kinds of organic, ma la organic matter laying around the garden, and so these are leaves. I needed to, you know, I'll look around, and I'm like, what do I need to get rid of because I need more space, you know, to do something else? So throw the leaves on the veg bed. Then this is really funny. This neighbor had planted a cover crop. This is a clover cover crop. And I went by one day, and I'm like, what, what, what are you doing? And then you can put, you can cut, cut all that down, great, and you can put it in my wheelbarrow. That'll be great. So this was another, uh, another source of organic matter. It's green, it's a green manure. So I got that, all that, that neighbor's uh, cover crop and brought it back and laid it there. And so that's what I'm adding to the veg bed to feed the soil microbes, and this is what we're getting in return. Are you planting plants or seeds? I usually start with little, little tiny starts. I'm not very good at seeds. And if I had a greenhouse, I would probably do more with seeds, but Seattle's too cold in the spring to really get seeds going. And they're, we're fortunate too, a lot of farmers will bring seedlings to the farmer's market and they're organic seeds and I feel pretty good about um, where, that, where the seedlings are coming from. Uh, I do have to, I will say this though, this is a really interesting kind of arugula that I've got here. It's more or less perennial, it's not the big fat leaves, it's these very, very narrow leaves. This stuff seeds like crazy in my garden. So I just let that go, and where it, if it falls where I want it, I leave it. If it falls where I don't want it, it's out of there. Just another shot of what a living soil can do. And as a gardener, I, I have the luxury, too, of mixing up vegetables and ornamentals and playing around with color and texture and how things look uh, through the season, which which is really fun, and I realize farmers have a completely different goal in mind, which is they want their crops to grow, and then they want those crops to get to market. So it's a, it's, I come at this um, a little differently. If I were a farmer, I'd probably say to heck with these ornamentals and you know, be, be growing stuff um, that I could sell. So I, I just, healthy, fo healthy soil food web, I think, we don't think enough about the life of the soil, and there's there's a lot of things growing there. I'll let you have a moment to take all of that in. Trillions of different kinds of organisms, from the tiny and invisible that we can't see, up to bigger things. Things like this. So, we I call this. These are the chewers and chompers. You put a big, you know, piece of cellulose out there in the garden, a wood chip or a dried up something. These are the these are the critters. These are arthropods that are going to start, going to kick off the decomposition process. And the beginning, it's mostly physical breakdown into smaller and smaller particles. So you want somebody like that. You want your grinders, of course. So the earthworms are taking all of this stuff in and they're processing it in, in their gut and they're pooping stuff out, which other organisms get to eat. Organisms like a few of these things. Mesofauna, this is a, a tiny arthropod. Probably if you had a really, really good eye, you could see that with the naked eye. Otherwise, a, a 10 power loop or something might be good. Um, this is a nematode. So these critters are what we call mesofauna. They're not as big as the chewers and chompers and earthworms, which we kind of consider macrofauna, if you will, of the soil anyway. These are, meso is middle, in between. And then, of course, we have the microbes. And what's interesting about this whole cycle, this is a nematode. They are, they are bacterial hoovers. They vacuum up bacteria because that's what they eat. And uh, what is cool about nematodes is bacteria happen to be pretty rich in nitrogen. So that means that the manure of nematodes is also quite rich in nitrogen. Nitrogen <coughs> is one of the primary things that makes a plant grow. You can add it as fertilizer or you can add it as micro manure. In essence, we were sort of manuring the soil from the inside out. And this is a clump of bacteria here, which these guys are hoovering up, as I, as I just described. And this is a fungal hyph, or this, this is a root hair. And what we have here are fungal spores, and these little tiny threads are the fungal hyphae. 
and I'll talk um, a little more about them. So you couldn't really see that, but it's, I think we probably, anyone at this conference probably has a pretty active imagination. So I always like to sort of close my eyes sometimes when I'm out in the garden and just picture all of this stuff going on in my mind's eye. And then I just sit there and think about it sometimes for a minute or two and get up and go back to whatever I'm doing. Um, the rhizosphere. Probably everybody in this room also knows sort of the basic inputs that, that, that plants uh, use to grow with. Of course, carbon dioxide and sunlight are inputs, kick off oxygen, take in water, nutrients, and minerals from the soil. But here's something maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't know about it. These, are, these red arrows are meant to signify something called exudates. And so a plant is pulling sunlight in, and it's using its miraculous green body to, to to convert carbon from the carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are fuel. It's a really good fuel source. It's also uh, it's a fuel source for the plants. It's also a fuel source and a food for the microbes that live in the soil, in particular in this area that's called the rhizosphere. If you were to draw uh, an outline around each and every root hair, that is, what's, that is what the rhizosphere is. It varies anywhere from, say, maybe a millimeter or so, maybe, maybe upwards to a centimeter. And it is probably the most active biological area um, that we have on this planet. And we have sort of underestimated that. Exudates come into this picture because plants, plants will use about 40% uh, or so of all of these carbohydrates that they make through photosynthesis and turn it into these exudates. And these exudates are, some, some are carbohydrates, some are amino acids, and more recently it was learned, even some fats. So they're shunting all of this stuff out their roots, 40, and, and using 40% of their energy to do that, which is sort of crazy. I mean, I don't think any of us would go and take 40% of a paycheck or all of our belongings and go leave them out on the street for anybody who would like to have them. There's a really, really um, neat purpose for this, and it has to do with what we call the biological bazaar. These exudates are feeding the microbial life that is flocked to the roots of a plant. This is, you can think of it like sort of a, an underground buffet in a way. And plants are providing all of these exudates, and microbes, are all over the root. There's even microbes that are inside of the roots. And they're taking in these exudates. And like any organism, they're metabolizing that stuff. And they're excreting some kind of a waste product. Only it's not really a waste product. We need to, like I said before, get away from that term. It's microbial metabolites that they're excreting that the plant is taking back up. And some of these metabolites are plant growth promoting hormones. That's right. The plant is relying on bacteria to make growth hormones. Uh, there's signaling molecules uh, of all, all kinds that we don't really even totally understand what they are and, and what they do. Plant root is also taking that up. And fungi are very interesting. They associate with roots on one end, and then they're also off here mining nutrients and minerals, phosphorus in particular, out of the soil. They transport it back to the root, and they say, hey, I've got phosphorus plant, and I will hand over the phosphorus if you hand over some carbohydrates. Because carbohydrates are not really readily available down in the soil. They're a, they're a thing made through sunlight and carbon dioxide, and so all of these subterranean life forms need something to eat, and it's these exudates. I just want to show you a picture of some of these, this, the fetching fungi here. So these are those hyph uh, the hyphae, and this is mineral matter in the soil, and they're out prospecting around for this. And it's even been um, recently, fairly recently learned that there's bacterial communities that are associating with the fungal hyphae out here where they're mining, and there's some kind of symbiosis going on where bacteria are helping the fungi get access to some of these things that are locked up in soil particles. So sort of the, the moral of the story here is that in a decent soil, a plant can probably have um, 
all of the things that it needs to grow, but it just needs a little bit of help accessing those things. So that's where the soil microbiome and the rhizosphere and the exudates, that's when you put that whole story together. You see, you start to see how plants and microbes are intertwined. Sure, a question. Yeah, those funguses that are accessing the minerals, when they give it to the roots, is it within the fungi or like how does it? Yeah, how does that happen? The transaction. Yeah, the transaction at the bazaar. So right. <laughs> the, the, the bazaar transaction works like this. Uh, that, that fungal hyphae's got the goods. These hyphae are like nutrient highways. So the phosphorus, whatever, whatever it is, is traveling through here. It gets to the root. Some hyphae actually grow inside of a root in between the, the root cells. And they do the transaction between the cell membrane of the fungi and the cell membrane of the plant cell. So it's sort of like one door opens, a hand shoves the phosphorus out, this door shuts, the fungal door shuts, the plant door opens up and says, great, I'll take that phosphorus, here's your carbohydrates, the door opens back up, so it's, yeah. It, and when was this discovered? This has been known, I mean, for at least, a, a, I want to say probably the last decade or so, I don't know exactly. Yeah, but it is, it is pretty recent. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing uh, about what's going on in the rhizosphere and with the root microbiome is that some of these, I mentioned the bacterial metabolites, some of these metabolites are sig signaling molecules that tell a plant, you've got a predator uh, approaching and you need to rev up mm -hmm. the production of XYZ defensive compound. So the plant does and it's for the purpose of pushing pathogens and pests off to some other plant, right? That's, that's all a plant's trying to do with all of its defensive compounds is, you know, send it scurrying along to some other plant. So that's, that's another thing that can happen, and it's, it's really pretty, um, pretty instrumental to plant health and defense that they have both um, information from microbes as well as signals that say, hey, this is what you ought to be doing, you know, depending on whatever the conditions are. All right. So I, go ahead. How does the, how do the microbes know that there's a bug eating a leaf? Uh, we don't totally understand all of this. But if anyone has read a book called The Hidden Life of Trees, this is all about how plants are communicating. And somehow, we don't totally understand it, but they are communicating. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the wonder and the mystery part of nature that, um, well, anyway, that's the wonder and mystery part of nature that people are digging into to, to learn more about this. Now, we grew up with magic. Okay, yeah, I like that, it's right. That's why I just sit, sit sometimes in the garden and think about it. So I titled this talk Food for the Soil because I truly believe that uh, just like us, soil has a diet as well and it matters a lot what we are feeding the soil because of all of these things I just talked about, the biological bazaar, the rhizosphere and so on. So you can have two kinds of diets. You can have fertilizer diet or soil life diet. And we've all seen the effect of fertilizers on plants. You can get a nice buff plant. I mean, it looks nice, right? Beautiful. But look below ground, look at what you know, is not on the produce shelf, and you have a paltry, anemic root system. So what's going on here is that you have nothing really in the way, little to nothing in the way of exudates coming out of this plant. Little to nothing in the way of exudates means not much in the way of microbial populations, not much in the way of microbial metabolites, whether signaling molecules or plant growth promoting hormones or any number of other compounds that the microbiome produces, they're, they're not getting taken up here because they don't exist. So contrast that with the soil life diet on just that one point on the microbial metabolites, and you have a robust healthy root system Exudates are pouring out, this bi the, the biological bazaar is robust, it's functioning, transactions are happening all over the place. And you get not only a buff plant, you get a buff 
root system and a, and a fully functioning plant as well, one that can also defend itself much better. So you're not, a farmer's not so much rushing in with um, all of these things to, to compensate for the biology, all of the agrochemicals. And soil life diet, you get a perfectly adequate amount of nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium, a great amount of micronutrients, and as I just described, bucket loads of microbial metabolites. So this is why diet for the soil really matters. It's sort of like carbon in soil, this is one way to think about it. We have a lot of biomarkers for our own health, blood pressure, temperature, blood sugar, right? We have all of these things. Um, Carbon, in a way, is a biomarker for soil health. Soil health mm -hmm. is this, this term we're all starting to use now. We don't know maybe exactly what it means, and there's going to be those of us who are going to want to get it down to the nth degree of what is soil health, and there's going to be others of us who might say, um, I think if we have a high enough level of organic matter in the soil, that's a surrogate for many other things that are going on. So I think... Uh, you know, certainly level and amount of soil life, level and amount of organic matter and carbon, it's like a biomarker for the health of your soil. And it's also, it gets back to that sort of wonder and mystery. I mean, I think the conversation about soil health is only just beginning, and we're going to be talking about what it is. Do you know it when you see it, or do you have to measure it, or um, things like that? Yeah, a quick question here. Um, in terms of growing vegetables, not or larger things, do you feel like there's a, too much carbon in the soil? I've, just, I've been arguing forever, and for a long time in my early years, people would be like, oh, you don't want to get really high. There's problems, you start having disease issues, you start having problems with you know, some insect problems, right. with high carbon levels, especially for annuals. Right. So I was wondering, if you, it sounds like you're saying you just want to grow that, but I have, I'm just curious if that yeah. now. I think if you're the kind of farmer who's knowledgeable, uh, and, and you're probably on top of your organic matter. I would like to test my organic matter every couple of years and see where it's at and figure out what's optimal for your soil and your crops. That's, that's how I would do it. Because if you are picking up these issues, and I have heard of them, then it's like, hmm, maybe this is not, not really the best thing to be doing constantly every, you know, every year. For those who don't know, some phalans are small, small creatures that attack the roots of plants and they can be pretty devastating. And I have, uh, I don't have some phylons, but I have sort of a version of, I have tended to overdo the wood chips, I will admit that. <laughs> and what I get are weevils. Because weevils are, they're kind of a chewer and chomper, and that's what wood chips, um, wood chips are, and they'll start chewing and chomping on the leaves of my plants. So I took care of that by, uh, for several years, not putting any more wood chips down. So those plants endured some damage, and then I took the food away from the weevils, and the weevil population declined. Yeah. But it's important, that's why, you know, whether farmer or gardener, you're out there looking at your plants, and you're noticing these kinds of things, and you're constantly doing these um, calculations of less, less of that, more of that. And I really like the idea of the metabolism the metabolism idea, it's sort of like you put too much stuff on and the processing cannot keep up with that. So it's this balance thing that you've got to look out for. All right, so I, I want to transition now. Um, Eve Balfour was uh, an English farmer and agronomist. She wrote this book, The Living Soil, uh, in the run-up to World War II. So we're talking, I think, around 19... Book was published in about 1943. And what is interest, interesting to me, first of all, this is a fantastic book. I highly, highly recommend it. It's out of print, but you probably can find it somewhere you know, on the, the interwebs. And what I like about Lady Eve Balfour, in part, is the subtitle of this book. I really love how she pairs human health with soil vitality. She was a peer of Sir Albert Howard, if you know him. He's often considered you know, one of the pioneers uh, who helped start the organic agriculture movement. Balfour, Howard, and interestingly enough, a group of doctors were noticing things in the UK, and they thought, we wonder if there's any linkages here. What they were noting is that soil quality 
uh, on many farms in the UK was not good. They had seen it decline. They noticed that the health of animals that were living on such farms were also not good. And they noticed that um, people that were living in these communities, that their health in some cases was also not good. And so they, they sort of had this idea, uh, hypothesis, that went like this. <laughs> Poor soil quality, leading to sick crops and sick farm animals, and they believed leading to sick people. And they didn't understand at that time mechanisms like the fetching fungi or a biological bazaar. But this was also a time in which fertilizers really came on the scene and were probably displacing um, much, much in the soil in terms of soil life. So Lady Eve Balfour wrote that book to tell that story and actually started um, an experiment called the Hockley Experiment uh, that unfortunately didn't, um, wasn't carried on long enough, but she went on to found an organization in the UK called the Soil Association, if you've ever heard of that. She was the, the, partly the genesis of that. This was their, this was their hypothesis. And uh, there was a, another person in the UK, David Thomas, who took a look at data from uh, I believe it was 1941 to 1990. So um, in that spread of time, went and dug up nutrient data on crops. And this is the kind of things that he found. There were decreases in all of these minerals uh, in UK spuds, carrots, and so on. And he also noticed that iron levels in meat had also declined in this time period. And Nutrient declines are a, a complex thing um, because you also have to factor in that if you're constantly growing things on soil, the only reason there's iron in the spinach that any one of us eats is it pulled that iron out of the soil, captured it in the spinach leaf, and now that's in our bodies. If you constantly grow spinach and you're never returning sources of iron to the soil, Spinach, after a while, will contain less and less iron. So that is part of the equation here. The other thing is that over time, we've tended to breed fruits and vegetables for things other than mm -hmm. nutrient density. We've, we've bred them for shelf life or for looks or for transportation or something like that. But the point is, is you put all of this together and you get food that is, in some ways, really not like what it was in the past. So this is a concern because we know every single one of these um, minerals up here plays some critical function in our body. I mean, anyone ever had anemia, right? That's, that's low iron. Copper is usually valuable for immune, immune processes and cardiovascular stuff. So all of this is, is critical for our health. And something else that is interesting about uh, how we grow our food and why it matters is phytochemicals. Phyto just means plant. Chemicals are plants. Are, uh, phytochemicals are chemicals that plants produce. And we're learning that many of these phytochemicals have health benefits. Uh, and the point here is not that you memorize these chemical diagrams at all. The point is, uh, I just want to run through these. So linalool, this is something that's in lavender, coriander, cannabis. Phytochemicals are usually some kind of a defensive compound that a plant is using, or they help a plant withstand uh, drought, heat, maybe too much water, too little water, all these kinds of things that allow a plant you know, to make it through its life. Sulforaphane is found in the Brassica family, and it has, has an effect that a plant will, a sulforaphane can turn into something called a mustard oil bomb where a, plant, a, a pest comes in and takes a chomp out of a leaf, it sets off this reaction called a mustard oil bomb, which is really fascinating to read about, and that plant is like, Ugh! I'm out of here and off to the next plant. And then curcumin is this, just this sort of amazing phytochemical that is found in turmeric. It's sort of this master shield around, um, around plants. And all of these phytochemicals that do things for plants, they also do things for us. We wrote about, we wrote about um, 
sort of why diet for soil matters in this article, which you can freely find on the internet. It's in a magazine called Nautilus. And what happens when you uh, start displacing the biological bazaar and substituting chemicals and so on for that, a plant cuts back on its phytochemicals. If it's got agrochemicals to take care of all of these pests and pathogens, phytochemical production goes way down. So that's why we titled it this way, you know, junk food is bad for plants too. And phytochemicals in our body, really interesting. Um, soybeans uh, have a phytochemical called equal in them. And equal gets in our gut and our gut microbiota ferment that into a compound that has uh, cancer prevention properties. So this is just an example of one thing. Other phytochemicals, uh, our gut microbiota will ferment into metabolites that travel via the vagus nerve, this is one of the largest nerves in the body that connects the gut to the brain. These microbial metabolites travel up the vagus nerve and they affect how we feel and what we're thinking. And lastly, some of these phytochemicals actually will make their way into our cells and to the cell nucleus and kick off biochemical pathways that are hugely important for anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer in our body. So we've all heard of free radicals. Well, many of these um, genes that get upregulated by phytochemicals uh, kick off um, pathways that take care of free radicals in our body. This is all about controlling inflammation, which we wrote, wrote about um, in The Hidden Half of Nature. So I just wanted to briefly touch on that. And I think really where we're at is we're, we're at this point where we have conflated the quantity of our crops with the quality of those crops. Because you can weigh things, you can count bushels, you can get money for biomass. And that's what farmers do. They are trying to sell their crops. But what if we could see the phytochemical profile and the mineral profile on a tomato or a head of lettuce? Maybe we would pick a different kind. Maybe we would pick this head of lettuce versus that one. And this is something I think that's really important because right now what we're mostly going on is the quantity of a, 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 of a crop. You know, we want that biggest thing. So I think this is hugely, this, is, this has become a huge issue that we've turned the quantity of something into the quality of something. Uh, Dave and I are working on a, a new project where we want to explore this idea of taking a, a much closer look at what, what exactly is going on um, from the standpoint of soil quality and soil health and linking that all the way up with human health. So what are the dots that we can connect and what are the kinds of things that farmers need to know and consumers need to know so that we can get this balance right. We of course want quantity, right? We need to eat food, but we want that food to have quality. And when we get that balance wrong, things happen. Uh, this is just some, some data that shows you changes in why we die from 1900 to 2011. And I want to draw your attention to the change in chronic diseases has been most marked. 1900, 36% of us dying from chronic diseases. 2011, almost 9 of 10 of us. That is a lot. Now, our health is complex. I'm not saying that this is only due to diet. But many chronic diseases, the underlying factors there have to do with diet. And it leads you to ask, too, then, well, what are the determinants of health? What is it, what is it that we know about um, the origins of our health, so to speak? And this is pretty interesting. Most of us think it's usually down here. And medical care is, don't get me wrong, it's extremely important. You have a bone break. You have some acute condition. Yes get medical care. But what we also know is that behaviors matter a lot. Behaviors like, what kind of food choices do we have? What's my behavior, you know, in picking this thing versus that thing? Behaviors like, do we have a place to get exercise? That's what we mean by behaviors. Environment, 
kind of environment are we living in? There's toxins in the environment. So you add up behaviors and environment, and you're, you know, 70% of what influences health. Genes play a role, too, not as much as many of us maybe have heard in the headlines. And genes operate within an environment, right? I talked about those phytochemicals getting into a cell nucleus and upregulating certain kinds of genes. That's an environment that is affecting um, how those genes are expressed. So this is, this, is, this is actually sort of good news, too, because there's other kinds of environments that we have. We have our gut, which is this fabulous onboard ecosystem. We write about in The Hidden Half of Nature. It does a lot of things for us that you'd be pretty surprised about. And of course, the soil. The soil is an environment. And if we can get these environments functioning with robust biological bazaars, because we've got the same thing going on in our gut, then this is, this is huge. And also, practices, agricultural, dietary, and medical practices are a part of this. These are really forms of behavior. And there's a lot of room for improvement in this environment and in these behaviors. So this is sort of how we can get, turn this around, right? And let's get healthy soil, healthy plants and animals that we're eating. So this is, this is one of the areas um, that I think soil is com completely underappreciated and untapped in. I mean, we've got medicine, medicine, so to speak, sitting there in the ground beneath our feet. If only we would treat soil like it's meant to be treated. And then, so what is this recipe then for, for health and soil and people? I think it's, it's lay down the weapons, knock off with the tilling, and the digging and all the disturbance that we do lay off of the toxins that's really harmful to life, to all of these creatures. And lastly, let's start feeding microbiomes. That is the engine of health in many, many ways for the soil and for our bodies. And why do we need to feed microbiomes? Dave and I took a look, look at the gut and the root, and when you, when you really think about it, this is a moment, again, sitting in the garden. Huh, the root is kind of like the gut inside out, or you could turn the gut inside out, and it's a lot like a root. And when it comes to microbiomes, guts and roots are huge, huge, huge interfaces of nutrient acquisition and processing. Now, processing is done by microbes that are churning out all of these medicinal metabolites or metabolites that are helpful for plants, and these metabolites underpin immunity, defense, and health in plants and people. So how are we going to feed these microbiomes? It's pretty simple. We've boiled the book down into six words, and it goes like this. Mulch your soil inside and out. So uh, that concludes my talk. And we, we call these three books together the Dirt Trilogy. This is about the plight of dirt. These are you know, the insights and understanding about how to put things back together. And this is the latest book. These are some farmers who are doing some very, very innovative things to bring soil back to life. So thanks for your attention. Thank you.